Hello and welcome. I'm Sam Califer, your host for Vision, the show where we talk all about the College of Arts and Sciences as well as its faculty and students. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Anna Osterholtz, an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures and a senior research associate for the Cobb Institute of Archaeology. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice. Yes, I'm excited to have you on and talk about all your great research. But first, I was hoping you could just introduce yourself, talk about your professional experience, and how you came to Mississippi State. Uh, well, I've been here since 2016. Um, I came here from, I moved here from Las Vegas, uh, where I did my PhD at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, yeah, that's how I got to, to Mississippi State. Uh, it's a great place to be. We have the Cobb Institute, and we have a wonderful department um, that's been very supportive of me going off and doing excavations and analysis in various places overseas. So I feel very, very lucky to be here. Yeah, and uh, it's great to have you. And yeah, the uh, Department of Anthropology and Middle Eastern Cultures, I mean, it's <laughs> y'all are always doing some kind of new research, finding an artifact, and so... I'm sure it's a great place to work. Mm -hmm. And in the department, you are maybe the main or one of the main bioarchaeologists. So could you tell me what, what is a bioarchaeologist and what kinds of information are you trying to discover? Yeah, so a bioarchaeologist, what I do is I excavate and analyze human skeletal remains. Um, and like any other part of archaeology, it's basically a way that we're trying to understand lived experience in the past. So I look at the bones to try to tell how old people were when they died, um, whether they were sick when they died, um, kind of childhood illnesses that they may have experienced, and any kind of trauma or violent interaction that they may have experienced during their lifetime. And we look at that through the bones. Um, we look at the, the different things about the bones, different um, pathological processes, different indicators for growth and development, um, and then you know, we look at the overall population structures as well. So right now I'm very interested in um, very young individuals. So I've been focusing in on um, neonatal and very young infants. Sure, yeah, and you know, the bones are one of the last remaining artifacts mm -hmm. of a person. And so you're looking at it and based off if, there's, if they're not grown well mm -hmm. or if they're broken, you can kind of figure out about the person and the culture mm -hmm. that they were from. All of the things that we do, the way that we eat, um, our basic health gets encoded in our bones. So we are the sum total of our lived experiences become written in bone. Wow, so to speak. that is so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, just so much information to pull from mm -hmm. that. And so, yeah, I mean, that sounds like a great career, super interesting. And you actually just had a pretty major success. You're part of a team that is being featured in a collection of articles published in Science, which is a leading major research journal. So what are those articles about? There were, it's a trio of three articles, um, and basically this is coming out of uh, various universities in Europe, as well as Harvard, uh, to look at a large-scale genetic study starting at the, the Calcolithic, so around 7,000 years ago up until medieval periods throughout Europe. Um, and they sequenced more than 700 individuals. There were 202 co-authors on the paper, um, on the papers, and uh, so I was very lucky to be able to contribute samples from the excavations that I've been involved in and the analyses that I've been involved in. Um, the studies themselves were really able to combine a lot of genetic data as well as uh, looking at linguistic and archeological data to really start to understand a lot about migration patterns throughout Europe um, and across the southern arc, so going from the Caucasus Mountains over to the Balkans and down through the, the Aegean and, and the Mediterranean. Um, so they were able to kind of look at the way that language mapped onto the genetic movements through time. Wow. Which is really, it, it gives us a lot of places to start and it allows for a lot more hypothesis building about who was going where. Sure. Um, and then there were the other findings that they had, probably my favorite one was uh, looking at the Mycenaeans, a group in Greece. And they found that they were really very, uh, they were a combination of lots of different genetic groups were coming in. And we've always had this model of, you know, the Mycenaeans kind of colonizing other places or being colonized. And so you have these massive social changes. And they were able to show by looking at the genetics of individuals from different socioeconomic status groups within different cemeteries that it's a really varied population. So we need to rethink some of those hypotheses about you know, groups coming in from other places and taking over. 
Sure. Um, and so that was a really, really nice finding for that. Yeah, that sounds so interesting. It's a very interdisciplinary study, mm -hmm. it seems like. And yeah, what you're saying, it's kind of offering a more complex understanding of the mm -hmm. past and yeah. all of these different things going on. I think the other thing that I really enjoyed about being part of this process was that the majority of the authors on the papers are individuals who are working in the countries, you know, at the universities in Turkey, in Croatia, in you know, Bulgaria, who were providing samples. So it was uh, it was much more much more holistic in terms of you know there were a lot of people that contributed to it. So I felt really good about being a part of that. Sure, yeah, and uh, I mean you were just talking about it, but from this series of articles, what do you think are gonna be the key takeaways about them? I think the key takeaways is that there, there were a lot of population movements going around. People were really moving around and coming into a lot of cultural contact. And that when we kind of start to construct archeological models and start to construct models about social interaction, we can take a lot of that into account now. Genetics is never going to, genetic anthropology is never going to be the the one way that we look at something, but it allows us to start to formulate new ideas and it allows us to um, branch out into how we interpret bones or how we interpret archaeological sites. Sure. So, yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yeah, and it, you know, just because it's a trio of articles being published in this major journal, it seems like a lot of people will see it mm -hmm. and maybe it can kind of have an influence on your field, mm -hmm. you know. So that's great. I think that's what everyone wants to be a part of. Yeah. So that's just so great. And you you were talking about it earlier, you know, working on this major project with so many different people. But yeah, I mean, what was that? Is that common? What was it like? And then what were your like specific contributions? It, it really wasn't, it's, it's not that common. You see more, a few more of these in the last few years of these large scale studies. Um, but it's the largest one that I know of, um, where there are 202 co-authors on, on the piece. Um, as far as the, the samples that, that we submitted, um, I've worked with Dr. Helena Thomas at the University of Zagreb, um, and we submitted samples from some excavations that I assisted her in from a site called Guzilla Gomilla II, um, and it's a Bronze Age site from about 1880 to 1650 BCE. Sure. Um, and then the other samples that we submitted working with Dr. Mario Novak from the Institute for Anthropological Research in Zagreb and Luina, um, Luana Paramon from the City Museum of Trogir, um, we submitted samples from the Trigarium City Necropolis. And those are first through seventh century um, AD uh, sure. from uh, uh, the Roman site, the Roman necropolis and the Roman city of Trigarium, uh, the necropolis associated with that. Sure. So, and those are the ones I'm actually still working with, the remains from the, the, the necropolis. Yeah, and I guess it makes sense to have so many different contributors on such a major, and that's like the only way to get this kind of view mm -hmm. or uh, framework, I guess. So yeah, it's a very interesting approach. Um, I, I didn't know if it was common, but it seemed like uh, kind of um, a new approach to it with so, so many. It's a lot of cats to herd. It's, sure. a, it's a lot of people to, in a lot of different time zones to uh, be working across and a lot of different schedules to coordinate. And uh, the, the, the folks at the, the, the Harvard lab did an amazing job of pulling everyone together. Uh, that's a logistical feat. Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I think the results justify, Absolutely. you know, that, that uh, effort. So mm -hmm. great to hear, you know, and I'm glad we've gotten to talk about all of this. And one question I wanted to ask, you know, if there's someone listening now, they're interested in anthropology and archaeology, maybe they want to take a class or major in it, but they're not sure if they should, you know, what would you say to that person? I happen to be our undergraduate coordinator as well. So if you're interested in, um, in, in being an anthropologist or in, in majoring in anthropology, I'm definitely the person to talk to. Um, basically, we, we have, you know, it's something that you get to do what you love. It's, you get paid to actually go outside and be outside and walk and, um, and dig lovely square holes. Um, and, uh, and these are things that, that I don't I think you, you dream about doing when you're a kid and then you kind of get talked out of it as a real job. Um, but this has a real job, and um, and you you get to you get to actually explore the human condition in a way that is always rewarding. Um, my primary interest right now is looking at you know the lived experience of Roman women and how that translates to the development of you know neonatal and and very young infants. 
Um, and we get to write stories, especially in bio bioarchaeology. We get to tell stories about people whose lives were never written down, wow. um, the people who were not you know, in power or in control, and we get to help to understand what it was like to be alive at that time. Um, and that, for me, is remarkably rewarding. Um, yes. And you know, our department, we have an excellent department. We focus in on uh, both Near Eastern archaeology and Southeastern archaeology. We have some amazing Southeastern archaeologists, and we have some amazing cultural anthropologists that work with living people, too. So we offer a great way to understand more about what it means to be human. Yes, yeah, and um, it is a very interesting space in that it's, it's history, it's sociology, it's anthropology, it's archaeology, and there is a place for a lot of different people and a lot of different skills. You know, you're kind of more of a science side of it, but then an anthropologist would be kind of coming at it from a viewpoint of theory mm -hmm. and um, sociology concepts. So, yes, I think, you know, if someone is interested in, it, in this, don't get talked out of it, you know. <laughs> Uh, you can get employed and it'll be a job that you like. And I think the, um, being on the you know, in the field and being part of a big discovery could be so rewarding. So yeah, it's fun. Great. It's really fun. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining me and telling me about all about your research. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Vision. We'll see you next time.